Thank you so very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, event today. Look forward to it. And so let's get started talking about a crop insurance when Ben gets my technology uh, in order. Thank you. All right. Another way to describe your three speakers tonight is you've got three old washed up hill staffers. Uh, I just want to begin with that. But again, as we look at this farm bill, I think there are a couple of things that we need to begin with. And um, I want to begin by pointing out something to you about the nature of getting this farm bill done. This is a diagram from the Pew Research Center that talks about the increasing partisanship in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you look over time, what we have seen is that there is greater and greater separation between the parties. There are fewer moderate Republicans. There are fewer conservative Democrats. Uh, I chuckled uh, about a year ago when Colin Peterson said, I'm the last blue dog Democrat left in uh, the House of Representatives, and it reminded me that I hadn't heard the term blue dog Democrat in a long, long time. I suspect if the Pew Research Center did another poll to compare to this one, that that gap continues to widen. And yet, we passed the Farm Bill last December. If you look at this, this act passed the House with 369 votes. It passed the Senate with 87 vo votes. To put it in context, the 2014 Farm Bill only got 66 votes in the Senate. So, Jonathan, they beat us by a long shot to put this together. The takeaway that I want to remind you of is this, that in a world of great partisanship in Washington, D.C., we passed a strongly bipartisan farm bill, and I attribute it primarily to one thing, and that is the alliance between farm groups and nutrition program supporters that was formed decades ago remains essential and bipartisan. There are disputes and there are struggles, but nonetheless, that alliance across the aisles has allowed a farm bill to get done in 2018 when there was an awful lot of reasons to think that it wouldn't happen, that it couldn't happen. And, and so let me just remind you that in, in one sense, agricultural policy, sometimes it's regional, but it is bipartisan by nature. And when it becomes partisan, it will be the end of doing what we have been doing, okay? Let's talk about crop insurance. And let me begin with a little bit of background about crop insurance. And let me note that I'm so old that I can remember when crop insurance wasn't done in the farm bill, okay? I testified uh, before the ARPA in bill in 2000 uh, on the Hill because I was told Crop insurance legislation is what we do when we're not doing farm bills. Pat remembers those days as well. In 94, we did legislation which was really significant in creating the modern crop insurance program. Uh, and, and ever since then, crop insurance is not only just in the farm bill, but it is a central part of the farm bill. Crop insurance and the Title I programs that Pat are gonna talk about cannot be disentangled they can't even be scored by the Congressional Budget Office without doing them simultaneously, okay? The other thing that I will mention is that in this modern era of agricultural policy, we have become increasingly market-oriented. Set-aside acres are not something that we talk about anymore and haven't for a long, long time. The thing that, that when I went up in 2013 and 14 and worked on the farm bill that struck me so much was that if you talked about a piece of policy as affecting or influencing how farmers manage risk, that was golden, okay? 
There were a few things that were claimed to be insurance that didn't quite pass my definition of insurance, but nonetheless, calling it insurance was helpful to getting it in the bill. In 2018, I saw no change in that dynamic. Risk was still the argument that made things happen in, in, in the farm bill. Another slide that I want to show you, this is, this is a, a survey that we did uh, early in 2018. Uh, Shay Gould, the lead author on this, was my undergraduate researcher, an outstanding uh, student in our department who is now a grad student in our department. Alba Clark, my colleague, and I helped her with this survey of U.S. adults in the United States, a representative survey, not of farmers, but of citizens in the United States. And, the, and we asked them to reallocate the budget of USDA, okay, in four broad categories, farm programs, conservation, uh, nutrition, and other, which captured a lot of different things. When you see what people uh, preferred, these are not just farmers, I remind you, this surprised me a little bit, is that the support for farm programs held steady. The support for conservation programs was really strong. People were shocked at the percent of the farm of USDA budget that was spent on nutrition programs. They want to spend less on it. By the way, if you explain to them more details about that, that they still wanted to reduce it, but not as much. And the other category was a catch-all of a lot of things. I generally argue that it had to be research and extension in that other category that people wanted to plus up. Uh, I can't prove that, however. But anyway, that's part of the context uh, of, of doing this farm bill. And, the, and I think it will be part of the context for doing the next one. When we look at crop insurance programs, then what do we see? We really that 1995-96 era was fundamentally a game changer for crop insurance in the United States. What we see there is that we created the catastrophic coverage policy, which got a lot of people to come on into the program. Uh, we increased subsidies for the program. We got acres, and now today we have over 300 million acres in crop insurance programs, and our subsidy levels have, have essentially leveled off for some time. Uh, we built the program since then. The other thing that I will mention that obviously most of you know is that the introduction of revenue insurance uh, came along at the same time, which also made crop insurance much more uh, attractive to producers. Now this is a chart, and I actually continue to use the old chart to note that this was already expected before uh, the Farm Bill was even passed. It, the red line represents the expected payouts by the Congressional Budget Office for the ARC program. You see a decline there, a pretty steep one. You see the blue line reflecting the price loss coverage program. They're, they expected a, a switching from ARC to PLC after this Farm Bill. But what I really wanted to point out to you is the level of expenditure for crop insurance and where it is and where it's projected to be relative to the traditional Title I programs. Uh, it has far exceeded those in terms of farm bill expenditures and is expected to going forward. Uh, as I've already alluded to, revenue protection is the elephant in the room of crop insurance. We've tried some other things. Uh, in my part of the world, an 80% subsidized tax program didn't attract but about 30% of acres. Uh, a number of other uh, programs are out there, but the traditional old yield insurance policy is now down to 5% of the total book of business. Okay? As we look also, some of my favorite maps to show you are that Average coverage levels for corn in 2018, uh, here in this area and much of the Midwest, crop insurance coverage levels are 75% or, or above. And you see in other areas it's much lower. And, and uh, note that in western states and places like uh, Arkansas, much lower and still a lot of cat coverage. A similar pattern when we look at soybeans. Okay. So we have in this region a very high coverage levels of crop insurance. 
uh, that have been in play and, and been at that level for some time. When we look at irrigation, we see, of course, the ir irrigation liability share uh, of the business in a county dominates in the Plain States, dominates in uh, some of the irrigated regions of the South, and you can see the same kind of pattern for soybeans. Um, one of the newer parts of the crop insurance program are enterprise units. This is a map showing the percent of the liability in a county that is covered by enterprise units for corn. Uh, you can see how much in cert, uh, of the business now is covered by enterprise units. And one of the more significant things that got changed in this farm bill is that you can now do enterprise units across county lines, which will probably lead to even higher percentage of enterprise units in our crop insurance program. And here's a similar kind of map for soybeans. Now, let me give you one more map, which is uh, differing risk levels in terms of base premium rates. Uh, this is what you see is low rates relative to the other part of the country in the Midwest because of the relatively low risk. You see higher rates in certain other areas. Uh, as you go across uh, regions of the country and different commodity groups, let me just remind you of one thing because I often get this question about the rating from one region to another. In general, the rates for a crop in a county are largely determined by the historical experience of that crop in that county, okay? So if you're grazing corn or soybeans in this county, then your rates are largely, not entirely, but largely determined by the experience of the program over the last 20 years in your home county, okay? Yep. Let me move on to subsidy per acre. And this is relevant to the part of the debate in the 2018 Farm Bill that I'll mention in just a moment. But you see the amount of subsidy per acre varies a great deal across the country. And that subsidy is a function of a number of factors. First, the value of the crop. Second, the riskiness of the crop. The coverage level that the farmer chose. And a number of other factors, type, practice, and things like that. Uh, and ultimately, this is the crop insurance subsidy level. And to tip my hand about what happened in the Farm Bill, it's the same subsidy schedule that we had in the 2014 Farm Bill. You see that the subsidy percentages, uh, which represent how much after the actuaries at USDA decide what the right premium rate for a, a policy is, this is how much they are subsidized, depending on basic versus optional and enterprise and SCO. Now, having said that, let me show you, this is one of the favorite things that I like to show people about the crop insurance program. Again, I mentioned earlier that we can divide the history, the modern history of crop insurance in the United States at 1995. You see the aggregate US level loss ratio bouncing up and down, and you see that loss ratio averaging at a much higher level in the 1980s, the early 1990s. In fact, when I did my dissertation uh, and was choosing a topic for it in about 1990, this is the question that we were asking. We, have, we had low participation in the crop insurance program and high loss ratios. How could those two things be going on together? What has happened since? We have had much lower loss ratios, we have ha also, and it's not showing here, but much higher participation. Why is that? Well, I've heard lots of suggestions as to why. I think all of them are at least partially true. One is, I was living in Columbia, Missouri during the 1980 drought. I lived through the 1988 drought as well. Uh, we have had pretty good weather in the Midwest for a number of years. Uh, certainly there have been exceptions to that, but it's been nothing like the 1980s. 
certainly we brought a whole lot more people into the program and actuaries will talk to you about the fact that we have a better risk pool. We bought people on into the crop insurance program and we have also changed our production systems. The technology that we're using, the, the seed varieties that you're planting, the production systems that you have are all likely better than they were and it's a better crop insurance program. Better data, better rates, better underwritings than it was at that time. So all these things together, and to be honest with you, one of the most common questions I get asked from reporters is, well, how's climate changing affecting crop insurance? Climate change has got to be driving up the losses in the crop insurance program. And the answer is, I can't see it in the data yet, okay? And my, the, my general answer is, it looks to me like, it, to date, we're outrunning climate change. Uh, may, we may not run, outrun climate change forever, but we have been. So all of this is precursor to talking about the 2018 Farm Bill and the crop insurance title. What I'm going to do now is, in my next slide, I'm going to give you a list of all the big changes that happened to crop insurance in the 2018 Farm Bill. Here it is. Memorize it. Okay, it is amazingly short list in terms of what I would define as big changes to the crop insurance program. I think the more relevant question to ask is what didn't happen? And when we look at that, we had serious proposals to cap subsidies at $40,000 per farm. We had serious proposals to apply AGI limits to crop insurance benefits. We had very serious proposals to remove or unsubsidize the harvest price option in revenue protection. And we had serious proposals to reduce the subsidy percentage on the crop insurance program. None of those things happened. Okay? So, since that didn't happen, what is the media talking about with respect to crop insurance? Well, here it is. Thanks to Adobe, I was able to count how many times the word hemp showed up in the farm bill and the conference language. 114 times, including hemp insurance. All right? As I was driving down the road uh, a few weeks ago, I started thinking about, okay, we've got so many people interested in hemp, growing hemp, insuring hemp, uh, all the different possible uses for it. And knowing the ingenuity of American farmers, I think we're gonna have a huge supply of hemp pretty soon. And since I live next door to the great state of Alabama, it struck me that we're gonna to have to find some new uses for hemp when it's all said and done. And I, rem I was reminded of my favorite Alabama movie about Forrest Gump and his good friend, Benjamin Buford Bubba Blue. And we may have to find some new uses for hemp. Uh, as, as Bubba was able to do with shrimp. Okay, being more serious about it, there are some things that people are talking about in this bill in terms of uh, research projects were, that were mandated in the bill. You can see, and not surprising, issues about tropical storm and hurricanes, uh, various uh, minor crops in terms of the size and volume, uh, interesting new uh, technologies, interest for uh, studies on subsurface irrigation practice, local food producers, and things like that. So that's really kind of the story when it comes to what's new in, in the Farm Bill. So let's talk about the uh, kind of where we're at today and looking forward. One of the very interesting things to me, and I'm going to throw this out, and I will, be, uh, I will admit to you, these numbers surprise me. I don't have a good answer to explain them. Uh, I've included rice and cotton as a point of reference, but most of you I know are interested in corn and soybeans. So for 2019, the projected prices for corn and soybeans in Ohio and then rice and cotton for the South, here are the projected price levels, uh, $4 on corn, $9.54 on soybeans. You care a lot about what those were. Remember that the crop insurance projected price is driven by the futures market. So whatever the harvest month contract is trading for early in the year before the sign-up deadline is going to drive those numbers. 
But here's the point that I really want to make. It's the far right column, which is price volatility. And there I find something rather interesting, and that is that even though we're in a trade war with China, dealing with tariffs and so forth, these price volatility levels, which plug into your revenue insurance rates, these are remarkably low. Okay? I personally would have expected that the soybean price volatility would be at least 18%. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was 20, 22%, but it was at 12%, as low as rice, and, and that's a very low level. Okay? If we talk also about the, the program, there's a couple more things I want to point out. A grad student of mine is working on a study right now looking at the overlap between ARC program and yield and revenue insurance. And we see that producers in this part of the world pay a lot of money to buy overlapping coverage. But our analysis suggests that they are rational to do so, uh, even though it's relatively costly. Because of the subsidy schedule, when you go to those higher coverage levels, you're also paying more for all your other coverage as well. Okay? Let me make another point. There, a lot of people are suggesting that in the new sign-up for Title I programs, that they'll, we'll see a lot of farmers, especially in corn, switch to PLC. It's going to differ. It's going to provide price-only protection rather than a layer of ARC protection. I think you all need to get your mindset in thinking about ARC and PLC are different. Now, if you just want to estimate which one's going to pay you the more, you can do that. But in terms of risk protection, they provide something very different. And so I did this little example here for a farm that averaged 160 bushel yield and $4 on corn. What is PLC going to do? It's going to pay against low price scenarios. What does revenue protection do? You can see the green cells here are reflecting when revenue pay, uh, protection payments are going to occur, and you're going to have uh, either low yield or low price causing those events. And then ultimately, when you put those together and add them to your market revenue, you get some kind of curious things going on. In extremely low price scenarios, you're getting a lot of double protection. And that's a different scenario than you would have had with ARC, okay? few more side notes that I want to make, and that is, number one, a, a phenomenon that, again, is curious to me. When we see these different coverage levels across different regions of the country, the one thing that is rather constant is very few of you farmers in the room appear to be willing to pay more than 4% of the expected value of your crop in producer-paid premium payments. I have no idea why 4% seems to be the boundary, okay? I'm going to try to study that some more, but right now it seems to be a pretty good estimate of where you are going to stop paying more for your insurance. Another point that I want to make, here's an example and actually a map from Indiana. Going forward, crop insurance rating is going to change, and it's going to change dramatically, and it's going to be big data that causes it. And as you all know, in recent years, you've had to report your CLUs, which means your insurance unit is going to be well identified to its geolocation. And what that's going to allow is a lot more precise nature of rating, and it's going to make the rates more accurate within county lines. And this is the result of a study that we did at Mississippi State that supports that that will have a positive effect on increasing the accuracy of, of rates. Here's a study that I did that I found rather interesting, and, and we published it recently, but, but we did it before the Farm Bill was done. A lot of people were talking about the changes in crop insurance, and will an, an argument was being made that large farmers are less risky, and if they leave the crop insurance program, the, the riskiness of the pool is going to change. I was rather dubious of that. We did some analysis, and what we found is essentially the same result on corn and soybean. And yes, we did find that a, an insured unit that was a part of a very large farm was less risky than an insured unit that was a part of a small farm. I don't have the answer why, 
And I will remind you that this result is mitigated when you have revenue insurance, which, which dampens the effect that I'm talking about here. Let, my, let me end by making a few more points. One is, as I showed with the crop insurance and the uh, PLC overlap, real risk management on the farm today is going to involve a lot of different forms of risk management financial management, cost control, integrating your crop insurance, your farm program, and forward pricing, and ultimately the ability to keep the data and do the records so that you can see what worked and what did not. I'm going to throw in a slide. I know it's past sales closing dates here in Ohio, but this is a slide that I suggest to people now in terms of crop insurance. Questions that you ought to ask your crop insurance agent if you have never asked them. Crop insurance agents don't, all, don't always like for me to show this slide because it slows them down, and I understand that. But now, you should be asking about can you do enterprise units across county lines? Can you qualify for trend-adjusted yields? Uh, do you qualify for the APH yield exclusions? What about a different coverage level? And what about separate coverages by practices? Let me end with this slide. Number one is, we see a lot of flooding that has occurred in 2019. We've got a lot of rain. We may have some late planting in some regions of the country. And there's also a lot of discussion about ad hoc disaster legislation. One of the things that I would say to you is that when I began working on crop insurance policy, the number one argument to enhance to build, to add subsidy to the crop insurance program was to do away with ad hoc disaster bills. And for several years, we didn't do ad hoc disaster bills. It looks like we're about to get back into doing crop insurance and ad hoc disaster bills. Um, I'm not sure that I think that's good policy, but that's where we're headed. And we know that we've got some losses like these grain bins we were talking today. Uh, is that grain and that bin insured? Uh, not by crop insurance, it's not. And so we're going to be having some conversations about that going forward. And it's going to be interesting to see the path forward with all of this. So with that, I'm going to shut down and turn it over to my two fellow speakers. Thank ben? You. Appreciate it. Thank you.